So hello everyone. On behalf of the Sheikh Abdullah Saddam Cultural Center, I hope you all have had a wonderful Eid and continue to stay safe during the tail end of the pandemic. Uh, you're here today to learn about the so-called molecular fountain of youth. It sounds really cool. Fascinating protein. It is about a fascinating protein that has altered our understanding of aging and given us hope about the amount, um, the amount of time that we can spend on Earth. So let's face it, you know, most of us would like to live longer, right? If you're like me, I, I mean, I would like to live longer. I know some people that would not like to live longer, but if you'd like to live longer, healthier lives, you would take a pill if there was a magic pill to do so, right? So that desire to remain alive uh, drives many of our actions, right? Um, like exercise, et cetera, and healthy eating. So granted, you know, we aren't close to the do-it-all magic pill as wonderful as that would be and as simple as that would be um you know that we can just swallow without a thought or something like that but we're at the beginning to see um some kind of potential reality where that might be the case so that's what we're here to talk about today so before i begin though um i'd like to say that all this content is educational um, i am not a medical doctor i have a background i'm just a curious scientist uh, with a background in uh, neuroscience and molecular biology. So anything I say today is not for, um, I guess, it's not medical advice. It's just educational purpose. It's just for educational purposes. And so what is anyone a scientist here? What's what's everyone's background, if you don't mind me asking? Student, we got a student, high school student, cool. And so why did you decide to come to this workshop? That is a good question. Why did you come? Art teacher, okay. It sounds interesting. Who remembers, before we, you know, just to start us off, nice little friendly thing before we get into the heavy science. Who remembers uh, these hideous looking creatures? Anyone? Who remembers what, what movie they're from? Which movie are these from? All right, so these hideous looking creatures, um, they're from the Disney movie Hercules. So, but they're based on three Greek moirai or fates as they're called. So let me go back to the first slide really quick. Um, so th this is the classical representation of the three Greek moirai or the Greek fates. So in ancient Greek myth, the three fates each had a role in making sure every being on earth, divine or mortal, uh, was living out their lives as it was assigned to them according to the laws of the universe. So Clotho, which is the ugly green skinned one on the left, would spin the thread of life, right? Um, and I think it's Lachesis is the one in blue skin. She's the, the really ugly one. Um, she would measure out how long that thread of life was. And then Atropos, the red skin one, would cut it. So she was in charge of ending a mortal's life or ending a, a god's life even. So in a sense, these three beings, these three fates were even above the gods. Um, so they had tremendous power, right? And the protein that we're discussing today um, is actually named after the green one, Clotho. So the one that spins the thread of life, you know, making a being's destiny, that is their role. So as I said, the fates even had power over gods. So think about that, you know, even, you know, except maybe Zeus, right? Um, but back to Clotho anyway, but any, the protein we're talking about um, is called Clotho. And it's named after the green fate, this one here, and for good reason, as we'll see. You can obviously tell that scientists are really good at naming things. They name, uh, I'm pretty sure there has, there has to be some kind of Spider-Man or Batman protein out there, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, but never mind about ancient Greek gods. We're gonna talk um, a little bit about mice first, a little bit about mice, and how Clotho was first discovered in them, because you know, mice, after all, are our model organism or one of our model organisms so because they have such genetic resemblance to humans so clotho was first discovered in mice and here is the protein clotho don't worry uh, there's two parts of it in the teal and the kind of purple or lavender um, don't be confused by the greek letters and the colorful squiggly lines this is how the protein is just structured this is this is a diagram showing us how it's structured right so it sure makes you think though why we why scientists like using ancient Greek myth and uh, Greek letters so much in science, right? Anyway, so here's our protein and, um, and the subject of today, basically. 
So look at its face, get to know it. This, that is Clotho, and it was first discovered in 1997 in mice by a Japanese researcher. And like many things in science, it was pretty much an accident. So Dr. Makoto Kuro'o found that mice that were missing two copies of this gene, because after all, every organism has two copies, or most organisms have two copies of each gene, right? Uh, one from the mother, one from the father. If a mouse is missing two copies of the clotho gene of, of this protein, then there are immense changes in their little bodies. So for one, the mice that didn't have clotho were much smaller. So you can see in the picture in A, it says KLKL. -K that means that mouse is, not, is lacking the clotho gene. Notice how much smaller it is compared to the normal mouse with the, that's labeled in plus plus. So they're much smaller, even if they ate the same amount of food as the other regular mice. And so number two, clotho, uh, the clotho deficient mice also had a really strange walk. So in B, it shows kind of how they sit or how they, uh, it's middle of the walk or kind of sitting as well. You see how the foot is kind of, it's kind of uh, out from under the mouse. It's not exactly under the mouse and it looks kind of lame. Um, so a strange walk very small and they also had underdeveloped sex organs so and they're unable to have offspring so you'll see in c d e and f the comparison in is an e of the ovaries and then an f is the testes of the mouse so basically the sex organs are severely underdeveloped not just that they also had something really fascinating they had a thickening of their artery walls, just like we would get, in, just like we would have as as old humans, as old unhealthy humans, we would get the thickening and hardening of artery arterial walls, where there's maybe some kind of fatty deposit in there, and it blocks uh, blood flow to the organs and the brain, and maybe causes stroke. So they had that as well. These clotho deficient mice, and not just that, their bones were also twenty percent weaker. They had osteoporosis. And so it's obvious that these mice were not doing so well. These mice kind of, if you could think about um, the kind of the constellation of all the, what these mice were experiencing, it resembled aging. So without Clotho, these mice resembled geriatric mice. And furthermore, you know, they would only live 20% the length of a normal mouse. They would only live for two months, not two years. So it's obvious that clotho is pretty important, right? So the mice were frail, inactive, had very, oh, here's the summary of all the things. Smaller size, poor walk, underdeveloped reproductive organs, and in fact, they couldn't have kids, they couldn't have pups. Uh, arterial sclerosis, thickening and stiffening of the, of the blood vessel walls, shorter lifespan, and osteoporosis. So basically everything that kind of resembled human aging. So what would happen though, um, so wait, basically these mice were, were frail, inactive, and had very poor health. They were almost fully deteriorated, as I said, after one month of birth. And so, you know, then naturally the question comes, what happens if Clotho is present, not only deficient, just like those poor mice, but what happens if you give the mouse a lot more Clotho or a little bit more Clotho? So it turns out, yeah, what would happen if we increase or overexpress clotho? Overexpress is just a term in genetics or biology. Overexpressing a gene, basically um, taking a gene and ramping it up or turning up the knob. So yeah, if, if clotho had some relation to aging, then this experiment, if we increased clotho, it would definitely help us answer the question, whether it was absolutely related to aging or whether, whether it was something else. So indeed, it did. Um, if you make mice that have higher levels of clotho than regular mice, um, you'd find that these super clotho mice live about 30% longer. That's, that's no small number, that's no small figure. They're, most, they're more active, they have more, less inflammation uh, levels as they age, and they appear younger for longer. And that's fantastic. So just increasing the amount of circulated clotho uh, increases lifespan by 30%. And so for people that are a little bit confused about the graph on the bottom left, uh, in the green, so the green line is just a normal regular mouse. And then the pink and the purple, or is it blue, the pink or the purple, those are basically mice that were given two different mutations to allow them to make more clotho. So basically 
the, they're kind of the same mice, but um, just in they only differ in the amount of clother they have. But basically, the more clother that they had, the longer their lifespan was. You can see how tremendous uh, the lifespan increase was. So, and another thing about these super clotho mice is that they're very sensitive to sugar. That's peculiar. If you know anything about diabetes, um, it's when your body can't properly uh, respond to increasing blood sugar from your diet. And so there's all sorts of nasty health effects that result uh, from increased blood sugar, sustained increased blood sugar. So, you know, but this isn't just good for the super clotho mice because they're not going to have to prick their fingers before or after a meal. It's good for us as well. Um, because it's telling us that clotho has something to do with balancing insulin and sh blood sugar levels in the body. So this, this key facet of clotho mice, the fact that they had really low blood, blood sugar and also they were, but not so low that they were really not doing great, but they, had, they were very sensitive to sugar. That fact of the, clotho, the super clotho mice was kind of the best clue we got in science about what clotho does and what the biochemistry of clotho is about. But before we get into that, I guess we should talk about fasting because um, aging and fasting, if you guys attended the talk that I gave last month, it's quite related. So we already know that if you put animals on a calorie restricted diet, um, they'll live longer. Pretty much every organism that you restrict the food of, um, the animal lives longer. So if you see in the top, row of pictures, there's yeast on the left, those two circles, there's flies in the middle, and there's mice on the right-hand side. So notice that each of these organisms, one of them is bigger, one of them is smaller. And there's a good reason for that. The smaller one have mutations in sort of insulin and growth genes. So basically the larger mouse is basically the normal mouse and the smaller one is a little bit mutated, but the smaller ones tend to live way longer. And oh, we have another entry. Yeah, okay, cool. We have another one in the waiting room, just admitted. All right, so um, we know that if you put an, an organism, any organism on a calorie restriction, it restricts the biochemical action of insulin and another hormone very similar to insulin. So what does that translate to in each animal? Well, it, it translates to less, uh, uh, what is it, uh, less, less cells in the animal dividing. So I should explain something though. Um, each animal, including you, your cat, your dog, your bird, every animal that you can think of, each animal is born with a certain number of cell divisions before that animal dies. And insulin or sugar as well is like the gas pedal um, to your demise. It's, you know, it's morbid, I know, but it is, it, that's how it is because sugar and especially protein, they are kind of the, um, as I said, the gas pedal on cell division. So basically the, when you fast, you're basically taking your foot off that gas pedal and you're telling your, your cells to stop dividing. And so thus, that's why we see animals live longer and maybe even humans. So, but anyway, clotho, back to clotho. Why are we talking about fasting? So, um, one of the mechanisms of clotho is actually to inhibit the action of insulin. So clotho slows or inhibits growth, which is really good for longevity. So just like fasting inhibits insulin and lowers blood sugar, so does clotho without actually fasting. So that is extremely interesting. And the way clotho does that, we won't get into the, the, the biochemistry, but the way it does that is not so much inside the blood. It goes to the cell, binds to your cells, and tells them not to respond to insulin. That's fascinating. So basically, it's turning off the gas pedal to cell division and growth. So it's blocking growth signals from insulin and uh, the insulin-like growth factor one, which you don't really need to know. But it's basically just like insulin. And fasting does something similar. That's the takeaway. So fasting and clotho kind of do the same thing. So it's very interesting. So there are parallels with clotho, fasting, and health, and longevity, right? There have to be. So they might be acting on the same mechanisms in, as in an organism, as I said, but now the million-dollar question, right? 
this is in, this is all in mice. Everything I've spoken about is in mice. What about humans? Turns out the clotho we study in mice is 86% similar in humans. So mouse clotho and human clotho is very similar. And also um, the way their clotho is expressed in the organs and all around the body, um, it's very similar as well. So the way it's expressed and also the actual protein itself is very similar. So chances are, if we study mice, we can gain a good understanding of what's going to happen in humans. But actually, let's look at humans. Let's not just study uh, mice. Let's actually look at humans. Indeed, if you look at, a hum at the human population, just the general human population, 25% of us, curiously, 25% of us have naturally higher clotho levels. So those people that have 25% or that 25% of the general population that have higher clotho levels, um, there's basically slight changes in the gene, in the protein, that enable us to have higher clotho in the bloodstream so it can do its magical work at stopping insulin and all sorts of stuff. So the people that naturally have higher clotho, well, guess what? They, they tend to live longer. And we'll get to it later, they also tend to have less disease. So you can see from this graph over here, this was taken from several thousand people. And you'll see many times um, throughout this presentation, actually, you know what? I was going to say that the, the key, it says FF and FV for the squares. It should say something else. I should have changed it. But basically, FV means they have a mutated version, one copy of a mutated version of this clotho gene, which enables it to basically, which enables them to have way higher clotho in the bloodstream. So that's why one of the reasons or one of the explanations, the possible explanations for them being able to live longer, even though it might be slight, it's still um, quite significant. All right, so, so there's better news though about clotho. It's not, it doesn't just help us live longer. And this is you know, shown or implicated, I guess, to help us live longer. Um, I should inform you about something called APOE4. So people with Alzheimer's, uh, just like you know, the general population, if you take a sample of a thousand people, there's gonna be people that carry this gene called APOE4. And we won't get into the specifics of what APOE4 does, but basically it's involved in fat metabolism and all sorts of stuff. But the really bad part about having uh, APOE4, even if you're just a carrier, if you have one copy of this, of this gene, you have a higher chance of getting Alzheimer's. But if you have APOE4, which gives you a higher chance of having Alzheimer's, and you have higher clotho, or the, or the mutation that gives you higher clotho, there's kind of a negative effect. The higher clotho balances out the APOE4, your risk. So if you look on the left, the left graph shows people that carry the APOE4 gene. And people, as I said, that carry the APOE4 gene, they have a higher chance of getting Alzheimer's. And this graph is showing how what is the percent chance of someone with cognitive cognitive impairment in their old age turning into an Alzheimer's case? So generally before Alzheimer's, people have kind of uh, cognitive impairment where you know they're not thinking as well, they're not remembering uh, things, but it's not full on Alzheimer's, right? And generally, sometimes um, it won't ever evolve to full on Alzheimer's. It's just, they're just senile, they're just old. And uh, that's what happens to the brain, unfortunately. But Sometimes it, or actually a lot of the time with people with APOE4 gene, it does turn into Alzheimer's. So you see as, as they age, as they get older, um, their risk of turning into Alzheimer's it increases, right? But as I said, if you carry the version of the clotho gene that gives you more clotho, you're at a much reduced risk. So you see in the orange line, those are the people with the clotho gene and the blue line, those are the people without the clotho gene that have APOE4. And on the right, those are just people that don't carry the nasty APOE4 gene. That is just the regular population. And clotho and basically clotho, there's no protective effect of clotho that you can really see. You see the lines are kind of the same on the right. So clotho doesn't really help people that don't have the APOE4 gene. It doesn't really help us that much. But people that do have the APOE4 gene, that is significant. So um, that is a very big deal. That is a huge deal. Look at the percent differences. It's like 20% for people that carry the higher risk factor for Alzheimer's. 
So there's many reasons though why this could be happening, right? So the toxic kind of nasty protein uh, that is thought, thought, that's a key word, to cause Alzheimer's uh, in the brain um, increases. So that nasty protein is called amyloid beta, beta, and it increases as people age. Everyone, you or me, even throughout the day, the amount of amyloid beta, this nasty toxic protein is accumulating in your brain. And at night when you sleep, it kind of clears away. But as you get older, you get less and less good or your brain gets less and less good, I guess, at clearing that nasty protein. And so if you see in the picture, this is kind of a, uh, it's an image of a bunch of brain cells in a dish. Um, the blue is that nasty toxic Alzheimer's protein called amyloid beta, and the green are a bunch of different brain cells. So you'll see that that nasty amyloid beta is accumulating outside. And it turns out that people with high clotho circulating in their blood have less of that toxic, nasty amyloid beta in the blood. And we're not sure why. We're not sure what that means or for how come our brains are better at clearing this toxic protein with higher clotho levels. We're still trying to figure that out. And the mechanism of clotho is in fact still being, you know, sussed out, still being drawn and figured out. So um, that might be, that might be one of the reasons why Clotho is protective of people that are at risk for Alzheimer's is because they're just better at clearing the amyloid. So, so believe it or not, Clotho also seems to protect people from stroke and heart disease. So people with slightly higher Clotho have less chance of having a stroke or having heart disease throughout their lives. And also, as I said, we're still trying to figure out the mechanism as to why. How come people with this high protein have less chance of dying from stroke and heart disease. Very fascinating. So think of the millions of lives that could be saved uh, or extended because of this. And so your mind must be thinking or going to places where, you know, how can we increase clotho naturally, especially in a, in the group of population that doesn't have the higher clotho level, or even there's a, there's a number of people that also produce way less clotho than the average population. So it's kind of on the on in a, as a bell curve, right? There's a, a number of people that produce a bunch of clotho. There's a number of also people that produce very little and they actually have shortened lifespan, higher chance of disease, higher chance of Alzheimer's, um, stroke, heart disease, all sorts of nasty things. So imagine if we made something just like, just like an insulin shot, a clotho shot where you can inject it. Very, very cool. And um, maybe this is a touchy subject, but clotho also enhances cognitive function. So the role of clotho in the brain doesn't just extend Alzheimer's and clearing that nasty toxic protein, right? Um, but also brain matter and intelligence. So children, it, it turns out that children with very high levels of clotho, they seem to have more brain matter as children compared to their other, compared to their peers. And we're not sure if, but the thing is though, they start out with a lot, a lot of brain matter compared to their peers, but then um, that difference is not really kept as an adult. It's more like it's just helping them in childhood. But we are sure that Clotho is enhancing cognitive, if you give a bunch of, I guess, tests, right, to people with that are super expressors of Clotho, that have a high, very high level of Clotho, and then you just give te cognitive tests to people just that produce an average amount of Clotho, what you'll find is that the people with clotho, very high clotho, they produce, they actually score way better on tests of intelligence. Look at this, this is gigantic. That's a very, very big difference. So as I said, just to summarize, people that produce slightly more clotho score better on cognitive tests than uh, people that have average amounts or less than average amounts of clotho. So, as I, you know, we were talking about the stroke and we were talking about amyloid beta and we were talking about Alzheimer's. And, and I was telling you that we're not exactly sure of the mechanism as to how Clotho is doing that. But the thing is with intelligence, we're kind of sure, we're kind, we kind of have an idea as to how Clotho is doing that. And the answer, uh, first we have to turn to mice and cut them open and all sorts of nasty things. But it turns out that Clotho might be enhancing our brain cells, our brain biochemistry at a very fundamental level. So this 
is a diagram. I'll kind of summarize it for you. I'll, I'll make it more simple. Here, let's say here's your brain cell, right? Here is your brain cell. There's a nice central body and a bunch of things that go out, right? And here's your the nucleus. So here is a synaptic, I guess a connection, a connection between another brain cell that is, that's what this is showing, right? So this is the interface between two brain cells. And at the interface between two bra brain cells, it seems like Clotho is changing the amount of receptors at uh, the communication site. And so what does that mean? That means that um, at least in mice or in maybe in, even in humans, Clotho is enhancing learning but because there's basically more signal occurring between two uh, brain cells and it's enhancing cognition as a result. So that's kind of a, a very exciting mechanism. I'm sorry if this is too technical, please feel free to answer or to ask questions in the chat if you guys are a little bit confused about this diagram. But basically Clotho is somehow helping uh, brain cells produce more of these special type of receptors that are involved in learning and memory. And that's kind of all we know so far about how Clotho is doing that. And so that might explain why Clotho is enhancing uh, learning. All right, so let me clear my drawings really quick. So, so there's not only longevity, um, Alzheimer's and stroke benefit uh, to having high Clotho, but basically there's an intelligence one too. So I'm sure you can think of many applications to Clotho, not just for enhancing longevity, but also to, to enhance, I guess, our collective brain power as a species, right? What sort of good things can happen if we collectively improve equally our intelligence, right? So Clotho is thought to fundamentally change brain chemistry by interacting with brain cells. We know that now. And, you know, this mechanism was seen in mice, as I've said, and we're still not sure of, uh, of humans, but the chances are that it's quite high. Great. So you might be, you guys might be asking yourselves, how, how do we, so we know all this information, right? So what good is the fountain of youth if we can't drink from it? What if I'm not in that 25% of the population that doesn't have very high Clotho levels, right? Well, um, there's good news. We actually know of several ways to increase Clotho naturally, um, just through diet and maybe lifestyle too. And one of them, or actually I'll get to them soon, but um, when you think of mice, a lot of the, the kind of the scientific ways to increase Clotho in mice, it's not really accessible to us. We can't change our DNA as adults that much. You know, there's not many gene therapies out there uh, that are approved and that are readily available and that demonstrate efficacy that show us that you know, we can definitely just go to the pharmacy and increase our Clotho levels. It's not that easy. And, um, you know, we do that with mice all the time. And we can't just start taking uh, a bunch of drugs that, you know, we don't need, but might have very high side effects that increase Clotho. We can't do that either. We need prescriptions and all sorts of stuff. So there have to be other methods uh, available to us that help us increase Clotho, increase Clotho and help us increase our longevity and health span, right? And the good news is that one of them is exercise. So there was a study done on uh, a bunch of people for 16 weeks, and they saw that high intensity exercise, so very short interval training, like I'm sure you've heard of it, it's called uh, HIIT, so high intensity interval training, and also aerobic exercise, just straight up running for or jogging for 30 or 40 minutes, it increases Clotho massively even right after exercise. So not just over the long term where you have to exercise and keep driving up your levels of Clotho. Clotho increases very quickly after exercise. So that is a very, very good um, idea or a very good practice to have in your life. Um, if you want to stay, um, I guess, older for longer or not older for longer, but healthier for longer. So, and in fact, you know, exercise, the, the adults, older adults that do exercise throughout their life and have more muscle mass, they live longer. So Clotho might be behind that, right? Very interesting. And I advise you to exercise. Number two, probiotics. So at least in mice, there's no human studies yet about this. But as I said, mice are very, very similar, I guess, in genetics or, or proteins 
to humans. And I guess, you know, their, their liver functions very similar way, their heart functions in a, very, in a very similar way, their cells function in a very similar way. And it's found that if you give two strains of bacteria um, found in, one is lactobacillus and one is bifidobac bifidobacterium, you can find them commonly in yogurts and all sorts of probiotic supplements. Um, kefir, a picture on, on, on this slide is actually kombucha. It's kind of a hybrid between a fungus and a bacteria. So anyway, probiotics, keep your gut healthy, right? Don't eat processed foods, eat a bunch of um, vegetables and fruit um, that help feed that good bacteria in your gut. And maybe, just maybe, you might be increasing clotho levels. So that is another great thing uh, to take advantage of. Exercise, probiotics. The next one, reducing stress. So stress we know is bad for pretty much everything, right? Um, and it's, it's behind a lot of explanations for a lot of strange mythical diseases that we not we might not have the, the exact idea of where they come from, right? So there was a study done on mothers experiencing psychological stress, um, just from either postpartum depression or their. Uh, and when I say stress, I mean psychological stress, not physical stress. They weren't straining themselves or whatever. They were experiencing a lot of issues with the new baby. Um, they were experiencing issues maybe with their marriage, finances, or whatever. And the mothers that experienced the most psychological stress showed tremendously lower clotho. So something to be said, right, with reducing stress. Find ways or perform, I guess, uh, practices or frequently or rituals to reduce your stress life or stress level in your life. Another thing, which I don't advise you guys do, <laughs> is take statin medication. So that's another strange one. Um, and so people that are on statins, so statins are basically, a, they're cholesterol medication, right? For people with very high cholesterol. Um, and statins, for some reason, they increase clotho. We're not sure exactly why, what the mechanism is, but funnily enough, uh, statins are there and they do increase clotho. So why am I talking about statins if the majority of you don't have high blood or high cholesterol or whatever? What's the use of talking about that? Well. I wanted to say that maybe we'll elucidate or make clear the mechanism as to how statins are increasing clotho levels. And maybe we can make some kind of drug in the future to increase clotho. Uh, as I said, that magic pill every day that you can take that has no side effects. Maybe statins are one of the ways where we can figure out the biochemistry behind that. And I should say, that's pretty much it. We don't know any other way of increasing clotho besides exercise, probiotics, and reducing stress. Sure, those could come, you know, they're kind of uh, uh, obvious, right? But uh, bear with us, I guess. I think on the horizon, we should see um, some new therapeutics coming, especially out of California and, you know, basically the biotech capitals of, of the states. We should see something coming out pretty soon. I'm pretty sure that um, there's a company called Clotho Therapeutics, and I know that they, they're, they're testing sort of uh, an injectable Clotho uh, to be trialed on healthy people and seeing whether it's tolerated really well and what kind of uh, biomarkers can you get from or what kind of changes can happen with injecting clotho, basically. So there's numerous uh, biotechnology companies like Clotho Therapeutics that are taking advantage of this kind of science. So I will say bear with the scientific community. This was only recently really discovered in 1997. And you know how things are in biotech and uh, you know the scientific world. Things are quite slow to reach, uh, to reach humans. So while you're waiting for that, and you know, I, I advise you all to exercise and uh, keep your diets quite, quite, uh, quite, what is it? What's the word? I guess uh, just watch them, you know? Anyway, guys, um, that's pretty much it for this presentation. It was a relatively short one. I think I'm actually a little bit ahead of ahead of schedule. It was actually only 35 minutes. It was supposed to be at around 45. Um, but if you guys have questions, I'll feel free to answer them in the, in the in the chat or ask them in the chat, and I'll do my best to answer. I'm sure there a lot of you have a lot of questions because I did kind of blaze blue, blaze through a lot of the science. And uh, that's intentional because I didn't want to lose people in kind of the, the scientific jargon of uh, what a gene is and, you know, what overexpressing is and all that. But basically the takeaway from all this is that Clotho is good. It helps us with Alzheimer's. It helps us with, um, with our cognition. It helps us clear toxic protein from our brains. 
Um, it helps us with stroke and uh, heart disease. And it might help us live much longer. I think I said that. So why isn't, okay, one of the questions. Why didn't they start working on this magic pill yet? Well, I think they have. That's the thing. Um, so this is a protein in the body, right? This is a protein in the body. And anytime you mess with the biochemistry of some animal, you need to know exactly what you're messing with. You can't just um, increase Clotho tremendous amounts and keep it constant, constantly uh, in tremendous amounts in the blood. That's not great for the organism, right? You don't know what you're doing. As I said, Clotho inhibits the action of insulin and, and insulin-like growth factor, which basically stimulate growth. So what happens if you, stim if you stop stimulating growth for a very long time? We need growth. We need cell divisions. We need new cells to, to, to basically replenish the things that degrade over time in our bodies. So to answer your question, why didn't they start working on this magic pill yet? It's because there's so much biology, so much complex stuff that is affecting or that is slowing us down rather. Everything needs to be cleared up before we start just jumping into things, right? So the safest bet is to do it through natural means like exercise and diet and reducing stress. Do animals produce clotho too? Pretty much all mammals produce clotho. They, they have, each animal has, has clotho and we're understanding that it is, it's pretty essential for, um, for, um, for not just longevity and keeping the brain healthy, but it's also really important for kidneys and for balancing minerals and phosphate in the organs. So I didn't go into that because it was a little bit dry. It was a little bit boring, I think. Just, you know, as a something to signal your cells to balance and especially your kidneys to balance the amount of phosphate in the in the body and, and basically put calcium where it's supposed to be, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't go into that because it, it didn't have extremely, um, I guess, a very high interest to us, right? Um, but I should say that clotho is produced in extremely high levels in not the brain, not the liver, but the kidneys. Of all places, clotho is produced in massive amounts in the kidneys, um, in tiny amounts in the brain, and then in also tiny amounts in male testes. I'm not sure about women's ovaries, but yes. Do you think we'll be seeing it sold over the counter? Would it, would it create an aging population more than young people like in Japan? That is a very good question. I think maybe in our lifetime, or at least my lifetime, I'm 28, I could be, we could be seeing it um, over the counter. We could be seeing maybe not just Clotho itself, but something that stimulates Clotho. Or we could, because maybe it's cheaper, you know, a drug that stimulates the production rather than a very complex protein that you have to manufacture. It's much easier to make a drug that stimulates the production of it, the natural production of it. Um, would it create an aging population more than young people? Um, I think yes, I think it would. Uh, over time, I think you'll see many people live to 100 in this current generation. The people that are going to, a lot of people that are going to be living to 100, that in record numbers throughout human history, we've seen, I think a lot of those people that will make it to 120, maybe 130, 140 are living amongst us now. I think those people are here. And so, yes, it would create an aging population more than a young, more young population, especially here's the downside of Clotho that I didn't mention. It decreases fertility. So I'm not sure if you guys have seen this. I'll, I, maybe I shouldn't advocate for it, but there is a new episode on Netflix for Love, Death, Robots. I love Death and Robots. It's a it's an anthology series on Netflix, and one of the new one of the new um, uh, I guess episodes. It's a 3D animated thing, and it's about this dystopian world where people live very long, and they take some kind of magic infusion that helps them live very long. The downside is that they are they cannot have kids, either by the drug or by the law. They just can't have kids, and so that's the downside of Clotho is that the longer you live, the less fertile you are, and the higher your clotho is, I would hazard the guess and say, um, perhaps also the less fertile you are. And I think also that has to do with the cell division thing that we were talking about. Because if you're making new eggs, or if you're making, uh, uh, not new eggs, but if you're kind of developing your eggs in your ovaries, or if you're developing sperm in your testes, you need nutrients, right? And if you have, if you take away the on signal, the gas pedal, 
then your body's not going to make that stuff. Your body's not going to make sperm. Your body's not going to mature those eggs to get ready for another baby or to, to, to reproduce. So um, that's the downside. Sorry to go on this long rant, but it's really cool. It's one of the coolest, I guess, proteins I've ever encountered, I think, is in my time as a scientist, just because it has very clear, powerful roles in biology. Here's another question. Is there a certain test one can take to show levels of clotho? I'm not sure, but there is a test to show your biological age. So there's not, I'm not sure if there's a test to show levels of clotho. You could, you could get a genetic test. And in the comprehensive genetic test, um, not like 23andMe, which only measures like tiny bits of your genetics, you can get a full genetic test for like $1,000 an hour, $2,000, which is not cheap, but it's a lot cheaper than it was 20 years ago. It was like a quarter of a million dollars or something like that, or maybe more a couple of years ago. So I highly advise if you find a company that you trust, um, sequence, your, sequence your genes and then get a report on your, on your genes and ask about Clotho or even... A lot of companies have search bars where you can just type in your 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 results and type in Clotho, and you might find that you are a super producer of Clotho. You might find that you are part of that 25% uh, or not. And if you're not, then maybe get exercising, get on the probiotics. <laughs> so anyway, guys, I it was short. I apologize, but I hope it was sweet. I hope it was quality and uh, quantity. Here's another question. Do our ancestors have higher levels of clotho since they used to live longer than we do now? And is that related to their lifestyle? Hmm. I would say it's related to their lifestyle. Um, you know, a lot of people say that our ancestors didn't live very long. But the thing is, um, that's just because of diseases like bacteria and, you know, viruses and also they didn't have modern medicine. But their bodies were quite okay, right? Before the agricultural age, especially. I think when humans started to farm and uh, basically grow wheat and all sorts of things, that's when human health started to go on the decline. When we were hunter-gatherers, we were very fit, um, strong. We relied on whatever we could gather or hunt. Um, so to answer this question, did they have higher levels of clotho since they used to live longer? Hmm. It's a good question. I think it's it's not it's not just related to clotho. I think it's it's for many for many reasons. We have a lot of uh, it's definitely related to their lifestyle, as you've asked, because they did exercise quite a bit more, especially before the agricultural age, where we all settled down into cities and stuff. Um, they exercised a lot more. They were out in the sun more. Um, they had a lot less stress because they didn't have work, right? And um, I'm assuming that they didn't have to run away from lions and tigers and bears every day. So they were a lot less stressed, I, I want to say, than we are now. So I think um, for the first time ever, the U.S. last year or the year before, they recorded that the average age or sorry, the average old age of the population in the States was actually declining. So basically, the States is kind of they increase their lifespan very uh, dramatically and, you know, because of modern medicine and all that, but for the first time in many, many years, it started to decrease. The trend is starting to reverse. And my idea is that my personal opinion, rather, this shouldn't be taken as fact. My personal opinion, opinion is that it's because of processed foods and sugars in the diet that, and also lifestyle. It's too easy to sit at a computer all day. It's, and we're, you know, and be in a highly stressed state. And it's too easy to obtain highly palatable, unhealthy sugars that keep the foot on the insulin gas pedal, on the growth gas pedal, and keep Clotho down, right? I could see that. So long-winded reply, but that, those are my thoughts. Cool. All right. You're welcome. And guys, if you have any other questions, please feel free to email me at this email. I'm going to put it in the chat. And if you'd like more, keep... Uh, I guess stay tuned on the Instagram and we might have some more interesting things to share with you guys. All right, guys. Bye. Thank you so much.